Let us continue our discussion of the determinant, and specifically the Laplace expansion that we saw last time around. Let's try and write down a formula for it. To that effect, I need a couple of definitions. One of them is the minor at ij of a matrix A. Specifically, if I take the matrix and I raise row i and column j and look at the resulting submatrix, it's a square submatrix as before, and its determinant is called the minor A sub ij. If I also include the sign associated with that minor in the expansion for the determinant, then we call that the cofactor. So the cofactor at position ij is the plus or minus sign, that's minus 1 to the i plus j, times the minor at ij. I can now rewrite the Laplace expansion in terms of these two definitions. The expansion proceeds one row or one column at a time. So I've written two formulae, one for a row, the first set of formulae here, and the second one for the column. So let's fix a row. Fix row number i, then the determinant of a computed with that row is, first of all, I'll have the minus sign, so minus 1 to the i plus j, where j is whatever column I happen to be in, the value a i j, and then we erase row and column that A is in and compute the minor of the resulting submatrix. If I include that plus or minus sign in the minor, then the formula becomes the sum over each of the columns of Aij times the associated cofactor. So let's look at an example we had before the determinant of this 4x4 four four matrix A, and let's use the second row for the expansion. When I raise the row and column that that 0 is in, I'm left with the determinant of the resulting submatrix. I'm left with the minor at position 2, 1. So minus 0 times the minor at 2, 1, plus 1 at the minor at 2, 2, minus 3, uh, etc. In terms of the formula then that we wrote, the determinant of A is a minus sign times the entry at that location times the minor A21. Then I have a plus sign uh, times the entry at that location times the minor at 22. Then a minus sign again, minus times 3 times the minor at position 23. And finally, plus 0 times the minor at position 24. Or if I absorb the uh, plus or minus signs with the minor, I get 0 times the cofactor at 2, 1, plus 1 times the cofactor at 2, 2, plus 3 times the cofactor at 2, 3, plus 0 times the cofactor at 2, 4. So specifically, if I look at the minor A sub 2, 1, second row, first column, so that's the minor associated with 0 here, erase the row and column that's, that's in, that leaves me with 2, 4, 3, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And that uh, 1, 0, 0 expanding around the 1, 0, 0, that leaves me with just plus 3 as the minor. And if I associate the sign with it, that happens to be a minus sign. So for the cofactor, it's minus 3. There's another way of organizing the computation of the wedge product, and that results in what is known as the Leibniz formula. Specifically, if you think about the expansion here, look at the example. From the first row, we have to pick each one of those entries in turn. Suppose we look at the time where we pick that second entry, so we pick alpha sub 1, 2 in our computation. The moment we pick alpha 1, 2, we no longer need any entries from that first row and no longer any entries from the second column here, and therefore the next pick that we have to make from the second row is either alpha 2, 1, alpha 2, 3, or alpha 2, 4. Let's suppose we pick alpha 2, 4. Again, we get to erase row and column that that is in. So I'm going to get to pick one number from each row and each column. If you look, a single entry from the first row, a single entry from the second row, a single entry from the third row, from the fourth row, and similarly for a column, a single entry for the first column, second column, third column, fourth column. So the term that we've picked in this example is alpha 1, 2, E2, wedged with alpha 2, 4, E4, wedged with alpha 3, 1, E1, 
switch with alpha 43 E3. And then we have to reorder the entries in the wedge product in numerical order. And that gives us, well, let's see, I have to start with E sub 2413, E sub 2413, move the 1 into the first position that's interchanging with E4 and E2, so two minus signs, the net effect is a plus sign. That leaves me with E1243, and now moving the 3 into place, that's yet another minus sign, so the overall sign, therefore, is a minus sign. So, when I write out what I get, I have, from the first row, I have to pick an entry, let's say it's in column J1. From the second row, I have to pick another entry, let's say it's in column J2. And finally, from the last row, I have to pick an entry sub JN, and I'll get a plus sign or a minus sign, or with the way this formula is written, if I pick from the same row or the same column, I'd get a zero. So the overall sign then is captured in this notation epsilon sub whatever the row number is. So epsilon sub 2413 in our example, it is called the levi civita density. The main point about this formula is just this pattern that the determinant is made up of terms where each term picks exactly one entry from each row and exactly one entry from each column. The next property that we want to emphasize is bilinearity. Bilinear means linear in each one of the entries of the function. And so I have to, first of all, tell you what the function is that we talk about, namely the determinant is a function of each row here. Uh, row one, row two, row n. And when we say that that function is bilinear, it means that if I take any one of these rows and substitute a linear combination of rows, so alpha times a row plus beta times another row, and try and compute that determinant, the determinant distributes over that plus sign and the constants can come out. So I get alpha times the determinant with row ri plus beta times the determinant with row tilde i. I can write the exact same expression with columns as well, uh, but it's easier to simply look at the examples to see what that actually means. So here is a first example. I have the determinant of this particular matrix, and I've written the third column with a common factor x. So I can pull that common factor x out of the determinant and I get x, the same two columns as before. The third column now has been scaled by x. Similarly, if I now look at this result and look at the last row, if I choose to pull out the factor 2, so now I have a factor 2 times x sitting out front, and that third row, therefore, I have to divide out that 2 again, so 0, 1, 4. This is pulling out a constant from a row or from a column. Similarly, I can split a row or column into a sum. So here in this particular example, my third uh, column here is x plus 2y, x minus y, 8x plus 0y. So I'll split that apart. I'll take that first column. I'll replace the third column with just the x part of that expression. So x, x, and 8x. And similarly, a second determinant where I pick the y's from that combination, so 2y minus y and 0y uh, left over. And we can do that with rows as well. So here, let's take that row 0 to 0 and split it. Well, I've written the 0 as plus 1 minus 1, and the 2 as plus 1 plus 1, and the 0 I left as 0 plus 0. So I split that last row into 1, 1, 0, and minus 1, 1, 0. The next important case is what happens with matrix products. And it will turn out that this is one of the fundamental properties of determinants that we are going to be using. And let me derive it algebraically. What I'm doing is the following. Start with some vectors a, a1, a2, an, and expand them in terms of vectors ej. Now, in turn, each of the ej's, let's expand those as linear combination of tilde ej's. And so I have the a's written in terms of the e's, 
and the E's written in terms of the tilde E's. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to substitute those E's back into the expression A directly. And rather looking at the uh, formula, which tells us that the result is a matrix product of the coefficients, let's look at an example first and see what that does. So I have my A's written in terms of the E's. I have my E's written in terms of the E tilde. And now when I plug the E's back in here, I get the A's written in terms of the E tilde. If I try and figure out what the coefficients are, well, if the E's were just scalars, then we would have A written as the matrix of coefficients 2, 4, 3, 2 for A1, A2 in terms of the E's. So A is equal to a matrix cap A times E. Similarly, E is going to be the matrix of the betas, B times tilde E. And when I plug the two together, I see that A, in terms of the E tildes, the coefficients are just the products of A times B. Now, with vectors, the algebra is exactly the same. So with vectors, I get the same result. And so if I look here, I have the product of the A columns, so 2, 3, 4, 2, and the entries in the E matrix, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 3, if I multiply that out, I get the result minus 1, minus 5, 2, 2. And indeed, when I do the substitution, that is exactly the coefficients that I'm getting. Substitution is matrix multiplication. Now let's see what that does when I compute the wedge product of the A. In the first formula, when I compute the wedge product of the A's with respect to the E's, I'm going to get the determinant of A, so the determinant of these coefficients, times E1, E2 through EN. Similarly, the second expression, if I look at the wedge product of E1, E2, En, I get the determinant of the second matrix times E tilde 1, 2 through N. So I get the A's as the determinant of A times the reference volume E1, 2, N, and the E's in terms of the determinant of B times the reference volume E tilde 1, 2, N. And when I substitute that second expression in the first, I get that my A's are the determinant of A times the determinant of B times my reference hypervolume written in terms of the E tilde. If instead I start with the A's and write them in the E tildes and compute that wedge product, this time the coefficient is the determinant of the product of A times B, and since I have to get the same result, what I can conclude, therefore, is that the determinant of A times B is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. That has quite a number of consequences. The first one, let's look at a couple of special cases. If I look at the determinant of alpha times A, well, that simply multiplies each row of A with alpha, and from the wedge product, I'll have to pull that alpha out of every row and get, therefore, n terms alpha times the determinant of A. That's one way of looking at it. But the other way to look at it with our product formula is if I write alpha A as alpha I times A, where I is just the right size, namely for an n by n matrix, it's an I of size n by n, then using the product formula, I get alpha times i. Then I get the determinant of alpha i times the determinant of a. And alpha i, when i is size n by n, has n entries on the diagonal, and therefore alpha to the nth power times the determinant of a. Another example is if I take powers of a, if I take a times a times a, k terms like that. Well, I can write that as the determinant of A times A times A, where A occurs K times. Group them into A times the remaining terms of A. Apply the product formula, so I get the determinant of A times, now it's A K minus 1, and keep applying our product rule. The determinant of A to the K is the determinant of A raised to the Kth power. So let's summarize the theorems that we have so far. If I have square matrices A and B of size n by n, 
then our product formula says that the determinant of a times b is equal to the determinant of a times the determinant of b. That if I look at a to the k and try and compute the determinant of that power, it's just the determinant of a raised to that power. This works for positive integers k, but when the inverse of a exists, that formula actually generalizes to any positive or negative integers. So a to the minus 2 will simply mean the inverse of a raised to the second power, so the inverse of a times itself. Alpha times a comes out as alpha to the power n times the determinant of a. And let me remind you of the transpose formula as well. The determinant of the transpose is equal to the determinant of a. One application of these formulae is to compute the determinant of the inverse matrix. I start with the defining property that A inverse times A is equal to I. And from that, if I take the determinant on both sides, I get that the determinant of A inverse A is equal to the determinant of I, but the determinant of I is trivial, it's 1. Then use the product formula, so I get the determinant of A inverse times the determinant of A has to multiply out to 1. And now, if that determinant of A is non-zero, I can divide through by it, and I find that the determinant of A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A. Here, I have assumed that the determinant of A is not equal to 0. We'll show below that for an inverse matrix, that always has to be true. So as an example, if I have a matrix with determinant 10, we immediately conclude that the inverse of that matrix exists and has a determinant 1 divided by 10. Typical problems that we encounter that use these theorems, one of them is simplifying an expression. So here I have the determinant of 2 times a to a large power, 1021, times the transpose of a times the inverse of a. Algebraically, that doesn't simplify anymore. This is the simplest I can write down for a general matrix A. But let's assume that we know something about the determinant of A, namely that A has determinant 3, and that we know about the size of A. Let's say it's 5 by 5. And look at how the theorem above, how we can apply each one of those rules. So we start with the determinant A equal to that expression. And the very first thing we'll do is we'll take that common factor 2 and we'll pull it out. Pulling it out raises it to the size of the matrix, so 2 to the fifth power, times the determinant of the remaining matrix. Now we'll use the fact that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants, so that gives us 2 to the fifth times the determinant of a to the 1021 the determinant of A transpose, and the determinant of A inverse. We'll next apply here, this is the product rule again, that A to the power 1021, that determinant is just the determinant of A to that power. The determinant of A transpose is the determinant of A, and the determinant of A inverse is the inverse of the determinant of A. So that minus 1 just pulls out. Those are scalars. Multiplying those scalars together, we are left with 2 to the fifth, determinant of a to the 1021, and determinant of a and 1 over the determinant of a cancel. And finally, plugging in the determinant of a, we get 2 to the fifth power times 3 to the power 1021. Another example, I may know something about the properties of a matrix. So, for example, for projection matrices, it turns out that if I take a vector and I project it onto a line, if I project that resulting point again, that second projection doesn't change where I end up. How that is captured by a projection matrix is that P squared is equal to P for a projection matrix. So suppose we know that. So we know that we have a matrix such that P squared is equal to P. Let's take the determinant of both sides. So we have the determinant of P squared must be equal to the determinant of P. And the determinant of p squared by our product rule is just the determinant of p quantity squared. So let me give it a name to make it look more familiar. This is delta squared. And I'll pull the determinant of p over to the other side. So delta squared minus delta equal to 0. 
factor out a delta, and what we see is that the determinant of p is either 0 or 1. It turns out that it's 1 when the projection matrix p is just the identity, when I project into the full space. The other big application is that we get a way of computing the determinant that's actually practical. Gaussian elimination, lo and behold. So let's look at an example and see what this does. I have written down a matrix A. I've applied the first matrix E1 to it and computed the product, putting those zeros in. So now I have A1 is equal to E1A and apply a second matrix. This time it's a row exchange matrix. And finally, I also apply the scaling matrix. So each time I'm multiplying in another matrix from the left of the stack, so here it's E3, 2E1, times A, to get the matrix on the right of the stack. Now, for each one of these formulae here, I can use our product rule. So I start with the determinant of A. At the second level, I see that the determinant of E1 times A is equal to the determinant of A1. And applying the product rule and solving for the determinant of A, I see that the determinant of A is the determinant of A1 divided by the determinant of E1. For the simple example here, the determinant of A1 is trivial since I have 1, 0, 0. Expanding about the first column gives me 1 times the determinant of 0, 2, 1, 1, which is equal to minus 2. And the determinant of E, that's a lower triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal, it's unit lower triangular, that determinant is equal to 1. So minus 2 divided by 1 is equal to minus 2, the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix A. At the second level, well, again, I get that the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A2, dividing out the determinant of E2 and E1. E1, we know, was 1. But E2, E2 is a row exchange matrix. And row exchange matrices have determinant minus 1 when we do a single row exchange, just exchanging row 2 with row 3 in this particular case. So this time we pick up a minus sign. The determinant of A2, well, now it's a triangular matrix, so it's just the product of the diagonal terms. It's equal to 2. So 2 divided by 1 times minus 1. That row exchange matrix has flipped the sign of A2, but E2 restores that sign. So again, the overall determinant is equal to minus 2. Finally, the last case, here I'm scaling my matrix A. So now E3 has a scale factor. The a3 matrix, the product of the diagonal terms, is 1. So no longer 2, we've scaled out that 2. It, we made it 1. But when I divide through by the determinant of E3, I restore that scale factor. So the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A3 divided by the determinant of the stack on the right, 1 divided by E1 has determinant 1, E2, the row exchange matrix, has determinant minus 1. E3, the scaling matrix, has determinant 1 half. And again, I get minus 2 as the result for the determinant of A. The remark that I want to make is that once I have AK in row echelon form, then the determinant of AK is just the product of the diagonal terms. So if there's a missing pivot, there's a 0 on the diagonal, and that matrix would have determinant 0 for a missing pivot case. So now look at this uh, expansion one more time and realize that scaling, that scaling matrix, that was a choice. I didn't need to do that. So if I don't do any scaling, then what happens is the absolute value of the determinant is the same from one time to the next. What does happen, however, is every time I do a row exchange, I pick up a minus 1. So if we don't do any scaling, then the determinant of A is equal to minus 1 times however often I'm doing a row exchange. Let's say there's Q row exchange matrices, so minus 1 to the power Q, times the corresponding matrix. It's going to be the 
product of the terms on the diagonal, and if there's a pivot in every column, that's just the product of the pivots. So the determinant of the matrix A is a product of the pivots to the plus or minus sign, depending on the number of row exchange. If we do use scaling, we have to account for the scale factors. So it's not that I can't do scaling when I compute the determinant, it's just that in the end, I have to divide out those scale factors again. If there's a missing pivot, well, if there's a missing pivot, then I see that the determinant of A is going to be the determinant of the numbers on the diagonal, so it's going to turn out to be zero. Whereas if every column has a pivot, then the determinant of A is going to be the product of the pivots is going to be non-zero. But a pivot in every column is precisely the requirement that we have for the inverse of A to exist. And so we get the following out of this observation, namely that a square matrix A is invertible if and only if it has a pivot in every column. But it has a pivot in every column if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. So determinant of A is non-zero, matrix is invertible, it's equal to zero, the matrix is not invertible. Notice, however, that in order to compute it for real, I need to compute the determinant, and computing the determinant is best done by Gaussian elimination. That's what we do to actually compute the inverse. There's another idea that we can pursue, and this one will lead to solving AX equals B slightly differently. We're going to use the wedge product. We are going to do that by rewriting our matrix equation AX equals B in terms of the column view, in terms of a linear combination of the columns with B. And we're going to wedge in each one of the A's. Let's do a simple example and let's limit our case to matrices are square and invertible. We could do the general case, but it's not worth doing. So let's look at an example with just two vectors, a two by two matrix x1a1 plus x2a2 is equal to b. If we take the wedge product with a2, say I wedge it in from the right, I get x1a1 wedge a2 plus x2a2 wedge a2 is equal to b wedge a2. But a2 wedge a2 is zero, that drops out that a2 term, and I'm left with x1 times the determinant of the matrix a1, a2, times E1 wedge E2. I end up with X1 times a determinant times E1, 2. On the right-hand side, I see the determinant of B and A2 times E1, 2. So X1 determinant A1, A2 times E1, 2 is equal to determinant of B, A2 times E1, 2. I can solve. X1 is just going to be the determinant of B, A2 divided by the determinant of the original A matrix. Similarly, if I wedge in A1, well, X1, A1 wedge A1 will drop out the X1 term, leaving us only with the X2 term. X2, A2 wedge A1 is equal to B wedge A1. I'll put them in numerical order. So I'll have to interchange A2 and A1 that picks up a minus sign, but I'll also interchange B with A1 that cancels that minus sign again. So X2 is the determinant of the original matrix A times E1, 2, equal to the determinant of the matrix A with the second column replaced by P times E1, 2. And so overall, I see that X2 is equal to the determinant of A in the denominator, and in the numerator, the determinant of A1, B. The reason I've outlined the B vector in red is the following. X1 here, the first entry in the solution, what I do is I take my A matrix and I replace the first column in that A matrix with B in the numerator. For X2, that's the second entry in the X vector, I replace the second column of A with the B vector. It turns out that this pattern will generalize. Let's do a numerical example and then discuss how this works geometrically. It has a very simple interpretation. Here's my A matrix, 2, 2, 6, minus 3, my B vector, 6, 9. And applying my two formulae, x1 is equal to the determinant of A is in the denominator. It's equal to minus 18. 
And in the numerator for x1, I replace the first column of a with b, and that determinant is minus 36, so x1 turns out to be equal to 2. For x2, that's the second entry in x, I'll replace the second entry in the a matrix with b, that determinant is minus 18, and so x2 is equal to 1. So I've solved my ax equals b problem, and since the determinant of a is non-zero, I know that a has an inverse, a unique solution. I found a solution, it is the unique solution, it's the only solution. So for the geometric interpretation, let's look again at what we have, and I'll look at the x2 case because it's right above. So the x2 case say that x2 times the determinant of a1, a2, e1, a2, that's the wedge product of x2, a2, and a1. Let's see. If I interchange the signs, it's a1 wedged with x2, a2. That's this gray parallelogram here. And on the right-hand side, I have a1 wedged with b, a1 wedged with b, with the red vector b. That's a 10 parallelogram over here. And if you look, I can slide that a1 vector, that 10 parallelogram, right down to the gray parallelogram. So the area of A1 wedge B is the same as the area of A1 wedged with X2, A2. It's just a slight property. So Kramer's rule results from sliding appropriately chosen parallelograms. The general case is similar. For the ith entry of vector X in AX equals B, I'm going to take the ith column of the matrix for A and replace it with B, divided by the determinant of A. So let's look at an example here. A this time is 3 by 3. B is this vector 3, 3, 3. And say I want to look at the third entry in the solution X at X3. I'll take my matrix A and replace the third column of A with the B vector. So in the numerator, that's the matrix that I have to compute the determinant of. In the denominator, it will be the determinant of A. And if you compute it, the determinant of A is 3. The determinant of the numerator is 6. So x3 in this case is equal to 2. Now that I have Kramer's rule, I can actually write down a formula for the inverse. Because if you think back on the computation of the inverse, we found that we could compute it one column at a time by solving the problem ax is equal to ei, where these e's are simply the columns of the i matrix. So the first column of the inverse solves ax equals e1, the first column of i. Second uh, column of the inverse is ax equals e2, the second column of i, etc. And applying Kramer's rule to each one of these problems, well, Think back about Kramer's rule for a second. To get an entry, I have to replace a column by a column from i. That's going to have a single non-zero entry, 1 in it. Let's say it's the third position over here. So it's going to drop out all but the third position when I expand around that column. I'll pick up a plus or minus sign times the 1 that sits here times the minor left over for that one. So that plus or minus sign times the minor, that's the cofactor. Solving ax is equal to ei is the solution x is going to be written in terms of the cofactors. Overall, what I get when I'm carefully doing those substitutions is that the inverse of a is equal to one over the determinant of a times each one of those columns of cofactors but I have to be very careful about the position. It turns out I need the transpose of the matrix of cofactors that I would get. And I would invite you to actually write down the solution yourselves and convince yourself that we indeed will need that transpose. As an example, let's look at the general case for a 2 by 2 matrix. The cofactor for A is equal to, well, erase the row and column that A is in, that's D. The sign associated with A is plus 1, so the cofactor at 1, 1 is D. The cofactor at 1, 2, that corresponds to B here, well, I'll have a minus sign, and the racing row and column that B is in, it's going to give me 
minus c. Similarly, for the cofactor of 2, 1 is going to be minus b, and the cofactor for d is going to be a. So the inverse of a is 1 over the determinant of a times the matrix here transpose. And once you transpose that matrix, you'll recognize the formula that we had derived for the inverse of A for a general 2 by 2 matrix. It's, however, not practical to use Kramer's rule in general. But think about what is required. I have to compute the determinant of A. I have to divide out the determinant of A. That's an n by n matrix. And then for each one of the cofactors, I'll have to compute the minor. There are n squared cofactors sitting here, and each one is a minor, so size n minus 1 times n minus 1. So to use that formula, I have to compute a determinant of a matrix of size n by n, and n squared determinants of matrices of size n minus 1 times n minus 1. Well, Gaussian elimination on a matrix is a far easier way of computing the inverse, and for now, as a reminder, we don't normally want to compute the inverse of a matrix. There's usually far simpler ways of solving our problems. That doesn't make that formula useless, however. We now know how that inverse looks structurally. Knowing that, I can apply that knowledge. And so, for example, when I provide you with examples of matrices to compute the inverse of, and the inverse turns out to be all integers, here is what I do. I know that when I compute the cofactors, if I start with a matrix that's all integers, the cofactors are going to be integers. They're just sums of products. What gives me fractions is dividing out the determinant. So if the determinant of my matrix were equal to 1, and the matrix itself were made up of all integers, I would avoid fractions. I would have an inverse consisting only of integers. I want a whole matrix, so I don't want patterns of zeros appearing in there. So what I'll do is I'll use my product rule. I'll write A as a lower triangular matrix with integer entries and an upper triangular matrix with integer entries. That's a full matrix. And to guarantee that A has determinant 1, well, all I need to do from the product rule is make sure that U has determinant 1 and V has determinant 1. So I'll multiply together a unit lower triangular matrix with integer entries and an upper triangular matrix with integer entries. So for example here, a 3x3 three three example, take u to be lower unit triangular with integer entries, v to be upper unit triangular, multiply that together, that gives me a full matrix, and when I compute the inverse, indeed the inverse has integers only. Our takeaway is that we found a practical algorithm to compute the determinant. It was just to use Gaussian elimination. So we have two methods now, the Laplace expansion, which is very expensive, and the practical algorithm, Gaussian elimination. Of course, if we use either one, we expect to get the same result from both computations. In the process of deriving that algorithm, we found a number of useful formulae. The product rule that the determinant of A times B is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. The power rule that the determinant of A to the K is equal to A raised to the K power. And I can always do that for positive integers. For negative integers, I can also use that formula provided that A inverse exists because I'm going to be dividing out the determinant of A, so I need that to be non-zero. As long as it's non-zero, I can plug in positive and negative integers in this formula. For reference A to the zeroth power, we'll simply set that equal to I. A constant times the matrix A well, the constant can come out, but it comes out n times, once for each row of A, or equivalently once for each column of A. So alpha to the n times the determinant. That n's power is easy to forget, so I emphasized it here by writing it in. The transpose of a matrix, the determinant of the transpose is equal to the determinant of A. And the other big result we had is that A inverse exists if and only if the determinant of A is non-zero. Finally, we found a new way of solving AX equals B that we might keep in mind. Namely, what we did is 
we took ax equals b and transformed the problem somehow into a new problem that we then solved in turn. And the transformation here was we used the wedge product. We wedged in columns of A into the column view of AX and found Hammer's rule, which we then applied to find a closed form solution for the inverse of A.